Well, uh, good, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. My name is Carl Stitchen, and I'm the director of the Institute. Uh, IELTS was founded in 1947, and our mission is to support and promote legal research both nationally and internationally, to provide services to the law schools of the University of London, and to bring together the academic and practicing legal professions for the benefit of the legal system as a whole. We are a nationally shared resource that attracts more than 6,000 scholars each year for research, collaboration, and knowledge exchange. We have specialist research centers, publish extensively and in support of open access, and we are home to an active community of researchers, fellows, and postgraduate students. Finally, as you may well have noticed, we are in the midst of a major multi-million pound refurbishment project of this building, Charles Clark House, which, as I'm always happy to say, is on time and on budget. Uh, the Institute is part of the School of Advanced Study of the University of London. The school brings together nine internationally renowned research institutes to form the UK's National Centre for the support of researchers and the promotion of research in the humanities. This evening's event is a collaboration between IELTS and the Institute of Historical Research. The IHR champions the value and importance of history in public life and as an academic discipline. It offers training and support to historians and provides an intellectual infrastructure. Most importantly, like IELTS, the IHR is a hub for innovation in the discipline and in interdisciplinary ways of thinking. It's particularly fitting that this evening's lecture is a collaboration between history and law. More generally, collaboration is central to the remit of the entire School of Advanced Study, and we look forward to more collaborative events in the future. I'd now like to turn proceedings over to Professor Joe Fox, the Director of the Institute of Historical Research and Acting Dean of the School of Advanced Study, who will chair this evening's proceedings and will introduce our distinguished speaker. Once again, welcome to the Institute. Thank you all for coming this evening. We're absolutely delighted to be collaborating with the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies on tonight's event. And as Carl said, it seems very appropriate that we do so because this evening's subject crosses disciplinary boundaries, and I think it requires interdisciplinary dialogue to confront the challenges that it presents. Brexit represents both a critical historical moment and a complex legal problem. And this evening we have an expert guide. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Vernon Bogdan. He was formerly Professor of Government at Oxford University, and Senior Tutor and Vice Principal at Brazos College. He's currently Visiting Research Professor at the Centre for British Politics and Government at King's College London, and he is a Fellow of the British Academy. He's written widely on government and politics, including the books People and the Party System, Monarchy and the Constitution, and Power and the People, a Guide to Constitutional Reform. More recently, he's edited a book on the British Constitution in the 20th century and written on the new British Constitution. He's been an advisor to the UK government and parliamentary commissions, including acting as a special advisor to the House of Lords Select Committee on the European Communities, 1982-1983. And he's advised several international governments, including the Czech Republic, Hungary, Kosovo, Israel, and Slovakia. He was awarded the Sir Isaiah Berlin Prize for Lifetime Contribution to Political Studies by the Political Studies Association, and in 1998 was awarded the CBE Services to Constitutional History. Tonight, he's speaking on Brexit and the Constitution, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, and I should say my latest book is called Beyond Brexit, and if anyone's staying afterwards, I'd be happy to sign it at no extra charge. Um, I really have to make a couple of apologies to start with. First, I'm not a lawyer, and secondly, to be, I suppose, one has to apologise to be talking about Brexit at all. Um, 
someone is I think. Is microphone? Oh yeah, sure. Can't you hear? Is there a microphone? <coughs> Sorry, I'll shout and talk to the microphone. <coughs> Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Right. Um, uh, Apologise to be talking about Brexit at all. I mean, someone said that everything that can be said about Brexit has already been said, but it's not yet been said by everyone. So, um, but I'm not going to be talking about the pros and cons of Brexit, but the, another issue, the effects of our European engagement and Brexit on our system of government and our constitution. And I think these effects have been very great. Now, the most present remark I think ever made on our European engagement was made about 70 years ago by Ernest Bevin, who was Foreign Secretary in the post-war Labour government. And when he was asked whether Britain should join the Council of Europe, which he mistakenly thought was a supranational organisation, or perhaps it was being prepared for that, he said, no, we shouldn't join, because he said, once you open that Pandora's box, you never know what Trojan horses will fly out. <laughs> and um, you don't need me to tell you that uh, our European engagement led to a lot of Trojan horses. And one of those Trojan horses was the referendum. Because as you know, uh, the 2016 referendum was not our first national referendum nor our first national referendum on Europe. That was in 1975, when we were again asked whether we wished to remain in the European community as the European Union then was, which we joined in 1973, or should we leave? And the outcome then was very different from the outcome in 2016. It was a two to one majority for staying in. Now it's very possible that without the European issue, the referendum would never have been part of our constitution because before the 1970s it was widely regarded as unconstitutional. And in 1964, a standard text on the British constitution said, it has occasionally been proposed that a referendum might be held on a particular issue, but the proposals do not ever appear to have been taken seriously. Now one main reason why the referendum was thought to be unconstitutional was the principle of the sovereignty of the Parliament. But of course, if Parliament can enact any law it chooses, it can enact a law providing for a referendum. What it can't do on that doctrine is to provide for a law prescribing a legally binding referendum, though even that is now in some doubt. And some people say, the alternative vote referendum of 2011 was legally binding. That's not this one going to go into. Now, the 2016 referendum was not legally binding. And those who don't like the results rather insist on the fact that it was advisory. But the government had said beforehand it would be bound by it. But they also said MPs couldn't be legally bound by it. But no doubt they would take account of the views of their constituents. Now, MPs did agree to be bound by it when they passed the European Union Notification and Withdrawal Act in 2016 by a majority of 384 votes. Now, a colleague of mine at King's, uh, Professor Takis Stradimus, who's a professor of European law, he said the 2016 referendum was the most important constitutional event in Britain since the restoration of the monarchy in 1660. And for this reason, that it was the first time that MPs have voted for something to which they were opposed, the first time in British history. The majority of MPs were Remainers. 479 MPs were for Remain in 2016, 158 for Leave. The majority of Conservative MPs were Remainers, 185 for Remain, 134 for Leave. The majority of Theresa May's Cabinet were Remainers, and of course a large majority of Peers were Remainers. But they felt themselves compelled to legislate for something they did not support. So the sovereignty of the people had overcome the sovereignty of Parliament. It's the first time in British history that has happened. And of course, this tension 
between people and Parliament has destroyed two Conservative Prime Ministers, led to two early general elections, and placed huge strains on the party system. Now, why was the referendum, first referendum in 1975, held? The first justification for it was this, that in the 1970 election, which was the last one before we joined the European community, all three major parties were in favour of British membership. So if a voter was against British membership, there was no way in which she could make her opinion felt. In other words, the party system wasn't working effectively on that issue, which many people felt very important, the European issue. But even had the party system been working well, there's a second reason why the referendum was held, and it was this, that there are some issues which are so fundamental that a parliamentary vote alone cannot yield legitimacy. In March 1975, the then leader of the Commons, Edward Short, said, the issue continues to divide the country. The decision to go in has not been accepted. That is the essence of the case for having a referendum. And David Cameron could have said the same in 2016. That voters entrust MPs with legislative powers, but they do not give them authority to transfer those powers to another body, such as the European Community. And for that, Parliament needs specific authority, and that requires a, a referendum. So, the two referendums on Europe have established the principle of the sovereignty of people uh, in the British Constitution. And as I said, before 1975, the referendum was widely seen to be unconstitutional. Now, in addition to three national referendums, which I mentioned, in 1975, the alternative vote referendum, and the referendum in 2016, there have been a number of referendums at sub-national level. Most recently, the referendum on Scottish independence in 2014, various referendums at the end of the 20th century on devolution in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, referendums on directly elected mayors in England. It may now be said to be a convention of a constitution that any decision involving the transfer of legislative powers of Parliament, not only upwards to Europe, but downwards to another legislative body, requires a referendum. So also does a decision by one part of the United Kingdom, <coughs> whether Scotland or Northern Ireland, to secede. And so also the introduction of a new constitutional mechanism such as an electoral system. Now, all these bills uh, not only as well make change in the law, but provide for an alteration in the machinery in which, by which the laws are made. <coughs> and the requirement, a, a good liberal rationale for this requirement in John Locke's second treatise of government, where he says the legislative cannot transfer the power of making laws to any other hands for it being but a delegated power from the people, they who have it cannot pass it to others. And so I think it's become an accepted part of the British Constitution. And I can back that up by talking about what one might call shadow referendums, referendums which were promised but not held. Um, for example, uh, Tony Blair in his uh, governments wanted to take Britain into the Euro, but promised that this could not be done before a referendum. Now that referendum was never held because not a single opinion poll showed a majority for entering the Euro. But you may argue that if the referendum hadn't been invented, Britain would have joined the Euro, because that was the policy of Tony Blair and his government. Now you may think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it seems to me the case. If you take the uh, election of um, 2015, 
the Conservatives were proposing a referendum, as you know, on Europe. The Labour Party was proposing a referendum on any further transfer of powers from Britain to the European Union. And the Liberal Democrats, a referendum on any treaty change involving a material transfer of sovereignty to the European Union. In the 2010 election, the previous election, the Conservatives were proposing a referendum on any future treaty to transfer powers to Europe, and a referendum on any use of a major ratchet clause in the Lisbon Treaty. The Labour Party was proposing a referendum on the voting system, a referendum on reform of the House of Lords, and a referendum on the single currency, and the Liberal Democrats were proposing a referendum on whether we should have a constitution. I could go back to the previous three elections. There are a large number of referendum proposals. I hope it's clear that firstly, the referendum is part of the British constitution. And secondly, that Brexit is coming about, not because government or parliament wanted it, they didn't, but because the people wanted it. And that's a situation without precedent in Britain's long constitutional history. The people have become, on the European issue, in effect a third chamber of parliament issuing legislative instructions to the other two. So the sovereignty of parliament is constrained not by Brussels, as the Brexiteers said, but by the people. Or to put it uh, differently, parliament, while not legally sovereign while we were in the European Union, was not practically sovereign when the decisions of MPs could be overcome by the people. Now, this is not uncontroversial, and people who don't like the result of the referendum have used a lot of constitutional arguments against it. And these arguments rather echo conservative arguments used in the 19th century, fearful of mob rule after the extension of suffrage. But it's a weakness in the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty, which Dicey was fully aware and he was actually the first to propose a referendum in Britain in the article of the Quarterly Review in 1890, elaborated in the introduction to the last edition of the Law of the Constitution, which he personally supervised in 1915, the eighth edition, in which is a long session on the section on the referendum which he favoured, and a long section on proportional representation, which he was against, and a long section on female suffrage, which he was strongly against. Um, and um, Dicey appreciated that the weakness of the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty was that there were some decisions which are so fundamental that a decision by the people alone cannot secure legitimacy. And the referendum gives Britain a form of constitutional protection, perhaps the only form possible for a country which does not have a codified constitution. Now, the worries that people have before the 1970s that people had about the constitutional consequences of the referendum now seem rather absurd. But the effects of the referendum have been huge, not so much on the constitution, but on the party system. The 1975 referendum heralded the breakup of the Labour Party in the early 1980s, the STP breakaway, because many pro-Europeans in the Labour Party felt they had more in common with the Liberals than with the left wing of the Labour Party, which was then against European membership. The 2014 referendum in Scotland led directly to the SNP surge in the general election of 2015, when they won 56 of the 59 Scottish seats. And you don't need me to tell you that the 2016 referendum has had huge political effects, splitting both political parties, turning the Conservatives into a Brexit party and dividing the Labour Party very deeply, a cultural division between, if you like, Hampstead and Hartlepool. And Brexit identity, survey evidence shows, is stronger than party identity and cutting across the party line. I say it did cut across the parties, it's now been achieved. Nevertheless, the referendum of 2016 did show a great interest in popular participation. A few years ago, people were complaining about political apathy, but well, perhaps people should be careful what they wish for. <laughs> you had a 72% turnout, which is the highest in any national election since 1992. 
And one of the reasons for that was that in a, in a referendum, there are no safe seats and no wasted votes. If you live in South Shields or Bournemouth, there's no point voting in an election because they're safe for one party or the other. Because every single vote counts uh, in a referendum. It's worth pointing out that turnout in the leave areas was much higher than in the remain areas. Amongst the four lowest levels of turnout, three were in the remain areas, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and London. And the young turned out to vote less than the elderly, but they're the same people who wanted a second referendum after the first. And um, it seems to me that um, the particularly high in leave areas are the so called left behind, and an illustration, I think, of democratic commitment on the part of the least fortunate in British society if you think that a threat to democracy is an electorate which has ceased to think about public issues. And John Stuart Mill says, we don't learn to read or write, to ride or swim, by being merely told how to do it, uh, but by doing it. And it's only by practicing popular government that the people will ever learn how to exercise it. But there have been, as I said, grave doubts. And they were first expressed in 1974, before the 1975 referendum, by Mr. Jean Ray, ex-president of the European Commission, who deplored the coming referendum. He said, a referendum on this matter consists of consulting people who don't know the problems instead of consulting people who know them. I would deplore a situation in which the policy of this great country should be left to housewives. It should be decided instead by trained and informed people. And modern liberals do find themselves in curious alliance with 19th century conservatives, the same arguments used against the expansion of the franchise. And some have come ruefully to sympathize with the views of the great French reactionary and opponent of the French Revolution, Joseph de Maistre, who said the principle of the sovereignty of the people is so dangerous that even if it were true, it would be necessary <coughs> to concede it. Now, the second effect of our European commitment was, in my opinion, and I appreciate here that this is not going to summon un up universal agreement, but the second effect is to limit the legal sovereignty of Parliament. And to make my argument clear, I want to distinguish first between two concepts which are often not distinguished, national sovereignty and parliamentary sovereignty. Now, uh, any treaty or international commitment a country enters into involves a sacrifice of national sovereignty. And it's a matter of debate and argument as to how much national sovereignty one should give up. It's a matter of degree. It's a pragmatic concept and a tradable asset. And you can say we ought to join NATO or the United Nations or whatever it is for very good reasons or we can oppose it. But parliamentary sovereignty is a quite different concept. It's an absolute. You either have it or you don't. Either parliament can enact any law that it wishes, or it can't. It's not a tradable asset like a national sovereignty. And it's not like boldness, a mere matter of degree. It's an absolute, like virginity. And just as you can't be a qualified virgin, you can't be a qualified parliamentary sovereign. The parliament's either sovereign or it isn't. And of course, the, uh, the raison d'etre of the um, European Union is not only a sacrifice of national sovereignty, which any international organization involved, but also from its point of view, a sacrifice of parliamentary <coughs> sovereignty. And that is what's caused tremendous problems in Britain, because this concept is peculiar to Britain and perhaps New Zealand. And it's one of the main reasons why we don't have a codified constitution for <coughs> having one if Parliament can enact any law that uh, it likes. Now, uh, Parliament faced the problem when it joined the European Union, which can, or community rather, which conceived itself as a higher legal order as to how it would reconcile this with the exposed sovereignty of Parliament. And the lawyers came up with a clever uh, uh, answer in the European Communities Act, Section 4, 1972, the two principles could be reconciled because it said that all future legislation was to be construed by the courts as if Parliament had intended it to be compatible with EU law. And that, of course, leaves open the question, suppose it can't be so construed, 
of supposed Parliament deliberately legislates in contravention of EU law. What should the courts do? Unfortunately, those questions did not arise. And the responsible ministers of the time did not believe <coughs> that uh, European law would be superior to British law, even though, of course, we entered at a time after the Van Ghent and Costa cases. And indeed, uh, Lord Hailsham, the Lord Chancellor, and Sir Geoffrey Howe, the Solicitor General, went further and went even further than Dicey, much further than Dicey, by saying it was logically impossible for Parliament to bind itself by limiting its powers. Lord Hailsham said it was abundantly obvious, so it seems to me nothing was less obvious, abundantly obvious, not merely that this bill does nothing to qualify the sovereignty of Parliament, but it could not do so, and that parliamentary sovereignty prevailed over any treaty you choose to name, including this one. And Sir Geoffrey Howe declared, the ultimate supremacy of Parliament will not be affected, and it will not be affected because it cannot be affected. But very shortly after, in the famous case of McCarthy versus Smith, it was clear that uh, Parliament uh, could, if it wished, explicitly repeal community law, but could not impliedly repeal such law. So that was already a limitation. But Lord Denning said, uh, Obiter, if the time should come when our Parliament deliberately passes an act with the intention of repudiating the treaty, or any provision of it, or intentionally, of acting inconsistently with them, says so in express terms, that I should have thought it would be the duty of our courts to follow the statute of our Parliament. And Sir Geoffrey Howe said um, that the courts would have to give effect to any repudiation of European law. To which the reply might be, that can you remain within a legal order and deny its consequences? At that point had been made clear to uh, the Europeans in 1970, we might not have gained admission at all, which some people might think we could do badly. And there must be some doubt as to whether the British courts would have treated an act of Parliament repudiating a particular provision of the treaty as valid. Because uh, the, um, our entry into the European community provided a new role for the British courts, because they were not only British courts, but they were also constitutional courts for the European community. And um, were the courts to have treated such an act as valid, the Commission might have brought proceedings against the British government in the European Court of Justice at Luxembourg, and if the British government had been found guilty of a breach of community law, a penalty would have been imposed. But the issue of implied repeal had been put and was decided in favour of community law. And as you know, that went even further in the second factor team case in 1991, uh, when the uh, courts actually questioned the validity of an act of Parliament, something they thought impossible to do, and decided to disapply part of an act of Parliament, which inadvertently uh, conflicted with European community law. So in this case, the courts were acting as a constitutional court for the European Union, and they took that power on themselves. And this, I think, reflects the point that the sovereignty of Parliament means what the judges decide that it means as a doctrine about the judiciary. And it followed, therefore, that so long as we remain within the European Union, Westminster was in fact a legislature of limited competence. And this is clear if you look at the obvious case of whether Westminster could limit immigration from the European Union legally while we were in the European Union. Clearly, it couldn't. And the British courts and tribunals were in effect constitutional courts able to pronounce on the validity of acts of Parliament. And there was now in Britain judicial review of primary legislation a concept hitherto unknown to the British Constitution. But Europe had also altered the balance of power in the British system of government in favour of the judiciary at the expense of Parliament and government. Everybody noticed there was a shift of power from Britain to Europe, but there was also a shift of power from Parliament, not only to the European Court of Justice, but to national courts. And of course, that was the case in all the member states 
but of particular importance in Britain, which had no history of the judicial review of primary legislation. So the effect of membership was to entrench provisions of community law into our legal system. And Margaret Thatcher, a former barrister, wrote in her memoirs in 1995, most of us, including myself, a rare admission of a fault, most of us, including myself, paid insufficient regard to the issue of sovereignty in consideration of the case for joining the EEC at the beginning of the 1970s. There was a failure to grasp the true nature of the European court and the relationship that would emerge between British law and community law. So the European Communities Act was fundamental. And in the words of the majority of judges in the first Miller case in 2017, it provided a new constitutional process for making law in the United Kingdom. It had therefore altered the rule of recognition in the United Kingdom. And therefore, in my opinion, produced a structural change in the British Constitution. Now, some say, well, uh, that's only because Parliament willed this limitation, and as we've seen uh, in Brexit, it could at any time leave the European Union. But I think that argument doesn't work very well, because even if you accept it, it gives the concept of a quite different meaning from that put forward by Dicey because um, the sovereignty of Parliament at least meant something different, because the rule of recognition before 1972 was apparently that Parliament could enact any law whatever, but the rule afterwards became it could enact any law whatever except for a law implicitly repealing a European community law. And therefore, to move from what Hart calls continuing sovereignty to self-embracing sovereignty, but as Hart pointed out, once Parliament had adopted that second version of the concept, it was no longer sovereign. Uh, just as someone who lost their virginity could not recover it, so Parliament couldn't recover its sovereignty. It exercised its sovereignty, limited sovereignty. It's very similar to the theological quandary about whether an omnipotent God can limit her powers. Uh, if she can, she's then limited afterwards. If she can't, there's something she can't do. But of course, it raises an awkward question because if Parliament can voluntarily limit its sovereignty in relation to the European Union, why can't it do so with respect to other statutes? For example, the Human Rights Act or the devolution legislation. What is special about the European community? And of course, the doctrine in fact attained was carried further in the FOBA, the Metric Martyrs case of 2003, when Lord Justice Laws argued that the whole category of constitutional statutes and measures which were not subject to implied repeal. And he listed Magna Carta, the 1689 Bill of Rights, Act of Union, Parliamentary Reform Act, Human Rights Act, Devolution Legislation. Uh, not clear what the criteria was for saying something's constitutional, when well, we don't have a constitution, but still, these uh, statutes also were not, in his view, subject to uh, implied uh, a repeal. So uh, it seems to me that this is a, a fundamental alteration of the rule of recognition of the Constitution as a result of Europe. Now the third um, effect of Europe on our system is in relation to human rights. Because the Lisbon Treaty, which came into force in December 2009, um, uh, also enacted the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And that draws on the European Convention, but its constitution is separate from it. And its 54 articles contain a number of rights which are not in the Convention. Um, for example, a right to environmental protection, which people didn't think, think of in the early 50s, a right to academic freedom, which perhaps they didn't think of then either. And the most important right, an Article 21 right to non-discrimination, and I quote, on grounds such as sex, race, color, ethnic or social origin, genetic features, language, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, membership of a national minority, property, birth, disability, age or sexual orientation. And this gives much wider protection than the European Convention. Also rights of the child, rights of the elderly, rights to social security, rights to health care, the right to education in the Convention, but not to health care. So a wide range of rights. And this, of course, shows that the protection of rights is a dynamic phenomenon, and that rights can't be frozen. Uh, in the state of the convention in, in 1950, if you like it, the, the convention's a living instrument, as many people say. Now, the British government um, took the view 
but they had an opt-out from the Charter, or to be more precise, the Protocol, Protocol 30, providing the Charter did not extend the ability of domestic courts or the ECJ to find any of our legal provisions inconsistent with the Charter, and the Charter would not create any new actionable rights in Britain or Poland, and it would only apply to Britain or Poland if the rights which it provided were already recognised in domestic law. And Tony Blair said as Prime Minister in 2007 in the Commons, it is absolutely clear that we have an opt-out from the Charter, though actually nothing could be less clear. <laughs> and the Foreign Secretary David Miliband told the Commons in 2008, a complete absurdity, he said, the treaty records existing rights rather than creating new ones. It created a host of new rights. And then he said, a new legally binding protocol guarantees that nothing in the Charter extends the ability of any court to strike down UK law. And dear Theresa May, as Home Secretary, told the Commons that the Charter was declaratory only, and we do not consider it to apply to the United Kingdom. Now, it'd be very odd if in a community of 28 states, one state, or well, two states, were allowed to ignore fundamental rights, and perhaps gain an economic advantage from doing so. And the European Court of Justice ruled in the NS case in December 2011, the protocol does not call in question the applicability of the Charter in the United Kingdom or Poland. Thus, the Charter must be applied and interpreted by the courts of Poland and the United Kingdom. And it's been used by British judges to do what they can't do in the Human Rights Act, and namely disapply parts of Westminster statutes because they're in conflict with the Charter. And in a very fundamental case, which I think ought to be as well known as fact attained, Ben Carl Bush versus the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs in 2017, uh, they did this. Now, Miss Ben Carl Bush was working in the Sudanese embassy, and she claimed against them for unfair dismissal, failure to pay her the national minimum wage and holiday pay, as well as breaches of working time regulations. And the embassy claimed immunity under the provisions of the 1978 State Immunity Act. Now, Walt Sumption, speaking at the unanimous court, ruled that sections of the Act were incompatible with Article 6 of the European Convention providing for a fair trial. And the remedy for that would have been a declaration of incompatibility, which has no legal effect. But Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights provides that anyone whose rights have been violated has the, has the right to an effective remedy. And Sumption said if the Convention had been violated, so also had the Charter. And he concluded, therefore, that a conflict between EU law and English domestic law must be resolved in favour of the former and the latter must be disapplied. That's the first time in English history when part of an act of parliament has been disapplied because it conflicts with human rights. And it's, far, it's now clear, or was clear, because we've left, but the, the, I mean, far from achieving an opt-out, the Charter gave stronger protection of human rights than was offered by the European Convention. And uh, in my view, the Charter exposes the very limited protection in terms of enforceability in relation to primary legislation given by the Human Rights Act. But you perhaps won't be too surprised to hear the Charter is the only part of EU law that is not being incorporated into our own domestic law. And therefore, it won't apply domestically in interpreting and applying retained EU law. Now, Article 5 of, uh, of the Withdrawal Act um, purports to provide for the preservation after Brexit of what are called fundamental rights or principles which exist irrespective of the Charter, that it doesn't tell you what these fundamental rights actually are, and they are, of course, no longer subject to judicial disapplication. They are dependent on Parliament, so there is no longer a judicial remedy. Now, it would seem that after Brexit, we will return to the constitutional position before 1973, before joining the European Union, when the sovereignty of Parliament was the main principle of our system, will be engaged in something that I think hasn't happened in the uh, democratic world that I, I know of, a process not of entrenchment, but of disentrenchment, and a process of exit from an international human rights regime. And presumably, if it has that effect, then by contrast with 1973, it will strengthen Parliament and the executive at the expense of the court. So it won't only transfer power from Brussels to London, to 
Westminster, which will strengthen Parliament and therefore the government as against the courts. And one interesting question is whether the judges will fill that kind of vacuum. And of course, restoring the sovereignty of Parliament is one of the main aims of the Brexiteers. But taking back control is not only taking back control from Brussels, but taking back control from the courts. This, um, but it therefore means a reduction in the rights of the citizen, the less protection. Now, this has a particular effect in Northern Ireland because, as you know, in Northern Ireland, residents can opt, if they wish, for Irish citizenship under the Good Friday Agreement, in addition to, or instead of, British citizenship. Now, of course, Ireland is not leading the European Union, and this means that uh, Irish citizens, as European EU citizens, will not be able to access their rights in Northern Ireland, although they're EU citizens. And this goes against the Good Friday Agreement, which wants to see parity of rights in the two parts of Ireland, um, and in, in fact hope for a Bill of Rights, um, a similar Bill of Rights in both parts of the island of Ireland. This, of course, takes the two parts of Ireland further away from parity, because the Republic remains committed to the Charter, but we are moving away from that. So that's a particular problem in Northern Ireland. And the further problem, and the question which I will put to you, I won't answer it, I'll leave you to answer it, but the other 27 member states, of course, uh, will remain committed to Charter, bound by the Charter. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are British MPs so much more sensitive to human rights than those in the other 27 states that they should be entrusted with this power of protecting human rights? I leave that question to you to answer. Now, the fourth and last um, area where uh, Brexit uh, and Europe has caused effect is on the whole devolution process. And uh, for the first time, a major act of parliament, the European Union Withdrawal Act of 2018, was enacted without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, which, although it had a nationalist government for many years, has not been contumacious in refusing legislative consent to Westminster measures. And as you know, the SNP government in Scotland has also said that Brexit is exactly the sort of material change in circumstances which justifies a second independence referendum. And this process uh, tested the status of the so-called Sewell Convention, which says that Parliament will not normally legislate against the wishes of the developed bodies without their consent. Now, the constitutional dispute came about because um, on the question of whether powers repatriated from Brussels should be returned to the devolved bodies. Now, in the devolution legislation, powers are specifically reserved to Westminster, and any powers not reserved are devolved. Now, agriculture and fisheries, for example, are not in the list of reserved powers, and therefore, in theory, under the total control of the devolved bodies. Now, of course, when this legislation was drawn up in 1998, we were members of the European Union, and devolution in agriculture and fisheries didn't mean much because policy there was decided by Brussels. And it's questionable whether all that would have been devolved if we hadn't been in the European Union. But the British government took the decision when we uh, left that uh, if all the powers were returned, the internal market of the United Kingdom would be damaged. Now that internal market, of course, was preserved by the European Union, which was a kind of glue holding the devolved settlement together. But that glue is now becoming unstuck. And the British government took the view, not wholly unreasonably, that if you had four different systems of agricultural protection in the UK, that would be deleterious, particularly as agriculture is a main topic in trade negotiations, and Westminster wants to say that we have to deliver if we have an agreement with America or whatever, we need to be able to deliver. And similarly, four different systems of fisheries in the United Kingdom wouldn't be sensible. And therefore, a common framework would be needed. And the government said that they wanted to retain 24 specific areas out of 153 areas of EU law that intersected with devolved competencies. And these areas comprise primarily agricultural support animal health and welfare, elements of reciprocal health care, environmental quality, 
fisheries management and support, food safety and hygiene law and plant health. There was a sunset clause claiming that governments would lose the power to make regulations freezing those temporary arrangements two years after Brexit day, and the regulation would last no longer than five years. And the government also promised to legislate for, not to legislate for England in the 24 frozen areas while common frameworks were being Im implemented so that England would not be able to take advantage of the freezing process to secure a competitive advantage against Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland. And this illustrates another interesting point uh, resulting from Brexit, that the UK government now has a more important role, not only as the UK government, but as the government of England, which of course has no devolved body, and secretaries of state for areas that are devolved to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, like education and health, are in practice secretaries of state for English education uh, it's not easy for the government to be both the government of the United Kingdom, which is like an arbiter between the four parts of the United Kingdom, but also one of the players as government of England. And that is a problem, I think, which will increasingly come about uh, uh, when um, the problem about devolution arise. But the Act uh, was amended, I say, without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And um, the default bodies accepted that there needs to be a common framework, but they said we don't like this unilateral uh, amendment. And the National Assembly of Wales consented rather reluctantly and proposed transforming the devolution settlement into a formerly quasi-federal relationship with the future amendments to the devolution settlement would need the consent of at least one of the three devolved bodies. In other words, the three acting together could veto the British government. You can imagine the British government rejected that on the grounds that it went against the sovereignty of Parliament. But the Scottish Parliament refused legislative consent. And they said that the constraints on them in the Withdrawal Act would be legal and binding. Those Westminster put on itself would be merely voluntary and dependent on the promises of politicians. And as I said, it was the first occasion. And the Scottish Parliament passed a withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Bill, making its own provisions. And that bill was supported by all the parties in the Scottish Parliament, except the Conservatives. Now, the Attorney General and the Advocate General for Scotland referred the Scottish Bill under Section 33 of the Scotland Act to the Supreme Court. And that ruled that one part of the Continuity Bill was out with the competence of the Scottish Parliament. Now, in an earlier case, the first Miller case in 2017, the Supreme Court had unanimously taken the view that although embodied in statute, the Sewell Convention was not justiciable and not enforceable by the courts. And they said it was uh, political. And that um, judges are neither the parents nor the guardians of political conventions. They are mere observers. And they said the fact that convention had been written to legislate didn't alter that position. But they said it was an entrenched convention, but it's not clear to me what an entrenched convention is if it's not justiciable. Now, it's fair to say that, West, that the Sewell Convention doesn't say Westminster should never legislate in those areas. It said it should not normally legislate. And there was a proposed parliamentary amendment to the 2015 Scotland Bill to substitute for the word normally, the words save in times of war or national emergency, but that was rejected. And the government can claim Brexit is far from being normal, a normal situation. But in a debate in the Scottish Parliament in April 2018, Mike Russell, the Minister for United Kingdom Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe, said that um, it shouldn't be a matter for political judgment from the Westminster Parliament. And it doesn't follow from the fact that an act is lawful that it's necessarily constitutional. After all, it's lawful for the Queen to veto legislation, but it's not constitutional. And you may argue that states can be broken up, not only through the activities of secessionists, but by the unilateral repudiation by central government of what was thought to be a convention. So Brexit raises very profound issues, and in particular the question of whether the sovereignty of parliament is compatible with a, a multinational state and a recognition of a claim to autonomy on the part of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, the sovereignty of Parliament implies a majoritarian model of democracy which fits ill with 
the evolution. And significantly, significantly this dispute was determined by the Supreme Court. Now, of course, the court can only determine the validity of devolved legislation, not of Westminster legislation. But that might not be as important as it seemed, because if the court declared that devolved legislation is intra-vires, it's very difficult politically for Westminster to override it. It can legally, but politically, it's very difficult. So that brings us a bit nearer, perhaps, to a system of federalism uh, where the court decides on the distribution of powers. And Dicey says in the law of the Constitution, there are three leading characteristics of completely developed federalism. The supremacy of the Constitution, which you may say is the legislation of the set of providing for the devolution. The distribution among bodies with limited and coordinate authority of the different powers of government and the authority of the courts to act as interpreters of the Constitution. And I leave open to you to decide how far we've moved along that road. Now, um, I want to conclude by saying that um, what um, Brexit does is to bring us back to the unprotected constitution that we had before 1973. Now, it's a, it's a common place in any book to say that Britain has no constitution. But arguably, while we were in the European Union, we did have a constitution, namely the European Union treaties, because uh, Parliament was subordinate to that. And the institutions of the European Union enjoyed only the powers given to them for the treaties. It was a system based on separation of power between its institutions, the Council of Ministers, the Commission and Parliament, and of course a territorial separation of powers between the EU and the member states and a system based on judicial review primary legislation, which since December 2009 has included the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Now, Britain leaving the European Union becomes unprotected again. There are only two other democracies that are unprotected. New Zealand uh, has half the population of Greater London and is a rather more homogenous society, I think. And Israel, although the Israelis are trying to develop a constitution, though it's not a matter of principle, but they don't have one. And the question usually asked, should Britain have a constitution, is, I think, uh, badly worded. The question would be, what is there about the air of Britain that means we alone, as alone amongst democracies, don't actually need one? And as I say, our membership of the European Union makes the constitution easier because it shows that rights can be entrenched against Parliament. So a codified constitution would not be as much of a leap in the dark as it would have been before 1973. And what is clear, of course, if we're to have a constitution, Parliament has to explicitly abdicate its sovereignty, not implicitly, perhaps, as in 1972. And Dicey made absolutely clear that it does not follow from parliamentary sovereignty that Parliament could never abdicate its sovereignty he uses the example of the Tsar of Russia, who is a supreme ruler, but could, if he wished, abdicate and so good Parliament. Now, Brexit uh, is a new beginning, and it's just possible that the very nakedness of British, the British unprotected constitution may provide a constitutional moment with a huge concatenation of problems pressing insistently for resolution. And it may just be that Brexit is that break in, con in our continuity which will herald a British constitutional moment. We shall see. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder whether I can use Chair's prerogative to ask you a historical yeah. question before we get into any legal debates. And that's really to ask you about your thoughts on the process by which a British Bill of Rights will be negotiated. I'm just very mindful of how the rights and responsibilities of citizens have simultaneously been deeply rooted, yeah. historically, hotly debated, yeah. highly divisive throughout British history. And I just wonder, what, what's the process by which we reach 
a uniting vision of what those rights look like beyond that charter. You mean a Bill of Rights, not a constitution? Yeah, yeah. Well, the obvious um, template is the European Charter. Yeah, the beyond the Charter, yeah. No, but it, yeah. it's good enough for the other 27. Why, why is it not good enough for us? I mean, we, we could all produce, no doubt, our own Bill of Rights, but there is certainly decent ones. And the European Convention is now very out of date. If you're drawing up today, you put many more rights in than you've got there. How would it come about? I, I don't know. I mean, in any process of a drawing up a constitution, it has to be a long process of public engagement first, mm -hmm. obviously. It, it, in my opinion, the most urgent need is for some sort of charter um, for laying out the rights and duties, the relative rights and duties of Westminster and the of Scotland. I think that is actually rather mm -hmm. urgent. And the constitution would follow on from that. Um, uh, I accept that on rights, the government moving the other way, wants to limit the European Convention, let alone accept the Charter, and to limit the power of the judges. But we shall see whether they can do that. Lord, Lord Bing, the great Lord Bingham, the late Lord Bingham, once said there are countries where the judges always agree with the government, but they're not countries where many of us would like to live. 